Hi, everybody. Justin Mead here with Homebridge Financial Services, and welcome to the Keys to Home Buying podcast. Today is actually episode one. It's January 3rd, 2023. Real excited to be putting this together. It's something I've been talking about for a long time. And just like everyone else, I just keep procrastinating, but finally pulling the trigger. So I'm hoping to see a little more polish as time goes on. Bear with me for these beginning episodes here. So the whole goal behind this podcast is to help home buyers, whether you're a first timer, second timer, millionth timer, whatever it is, uh, and you want to know more about what goes on behind the scenes to buying a home, this is for you, right? So I'm a mortgage loan officer. I do mortgages all day. I work with a lot of realtors. I work with a lot of appraisers, uh, inspectors, insurance agents, attorneys, you name it. And we're all involved. A lot of you probably don't even know, didn't even know that those types of professions were involved in the home buying process. So if that's you, then again, this is kind of perfect for you as you start your home buying journey, or if you're thinking about that next house. So today's episode, I'm kind of keeping it pretty simple, and we're just going to do a super high level overview of the home buying process from start to finish, what people are involved, what you should be prepared for. And then in later episodes, we'll kind of dissect little bits here and there. I'm also going to bring in other industry pros to interview about their respective uh, professions. So at the end of this month, actually, we'll be bringing on uh, John and George Black of Coldwell Banker. They're realtors in the area. Uh, For anyone who's listening and doesn't know me, I live in Colchester, Vermont. So my business is kind of centered around Chittenden County in Vermont, but I'm licensed in the whole state. Um, Realtors. I typically work with are in this area. So John and George Black, they're kind of Chittenden County realtors for the most part. And we'll, we'll get to know them a little more at the end of the month on that episode. Um, So we'll dive right in kind of the home buying process from start to finish. Again, really catering to first time home buyers, but anyone who's looking to buy, whether you bought or not, this is for you, especially if you used to buy, or if the last time you bought was back in like pre 2008, right? And the reason I'm using that year because that's when there was a huge world economic crisis, housing market crashed everything, and all all sorts of regulations were put into place. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was brought into existence, the Dodd-Frank Act. So anyone who wants to get super nerdy, you can look up those. But basically, pre-2008, if you had a pulse and could breathe, you could get a mortgage and buy a house. Post-2008, now we need a lot more paperwork. Um, So before we dive in, standard please uh, subscribe. I have had this on YouTube and out to podcast uh, hosting services like Spotify. So if you're a frequent podcaster or YouTube listener, please, you know, hit the notifications, subscribe, really help me out and share it with your friends too. Um, So home buying 101, right? Let's start from the beginning. You're a brand new home buyer or maybe you're a current renter and you want to become a brand new home buyer. What do you do first, right? I think kind of the standard of what people do. And this is what I did before I was in the industry, just kind of thinking like, you know, I was, I was in college, maybe thinking like, Hmm, maybe I want to buy a house, just go to Zillow. Right. And gosh, I don't even know if Zillow was around back then. I think they were now my situation is a little unique because my mom's been in this industry for over 20 years. So I had a little bit of an in with how everything worked, but talking to a lot of my friends, you know, it's just kind of, you see a sign on the, in the front of a house on the side of the road. And it's like, Oh, cool. That'd be cool to own one of those one day, <laughs> you know? And uh, I was never brave enough to randomly walk into an open house before I got serious. But, uh, you know, I think today Zillow is kind of the first place people go Redfin, realtor.com, AKA just go to Google type in. I want to buy a house. What's what's listed in my area and just start searching. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just, you really have nothing to go off of. Like, I talked to a lot of people and they're like, yeah, I'm looking up to 300,000 as a purchase price. Okay. Well, where'd you come up with that? Well, that's, you know, those are the houses that I liked. They all seem to be about 300,000. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's really important to know what you want in a home, but maybe have a conversation with someone like me before doing that. So you're not setting your expectations incorrectly. Right. So as a first time home buyer, you're kind of doing one of two things. You're either talking to a realtor first or talking to someone like me first, who's a loan officer. Ideally, you're talking to me first because any realtor you talk to, they'd be happy to have a meeting with you and kind of go over the process and steps 
of what it's going to take to get that house, but they're really not going to do anything with you until you've been pre-approved, unless you're a cash buyer, right? If you're a cash buyer, I won't ever talk to you. <laughs> I'd be happy to just have a chat and go over the process again, but you know, you don't need me if you don't need a loan, right? You, you come to me because you need to borrow money to buy a house and that's what a mortgage is. So any realtor who is working with you and they know you need financing, before they go show you houses, they need to know that you're pre-approved, right? So that you're not wasting your own time or theirs or anyone else's, right? The sellers don't want to put time aside to show you a house if you're not even eligible to receive the financing to buy it. So I threw in the word pre-approved there and there's going to be some buzz terms and, and jargon and I'll try to explain it as I go. So pre-approved, <clears throat> you probably have heard of that. And there's also pre-qualified. They're very similar, but not quite the same. And we might get into that today, but that's a good topic for another episode potentially. So pre-approved is essentially talking to someone like me. We're going to look at your entire financial picture. Uh, by that, I mean, we're going to look at your income, your assets, meaning money in the bank or like money you have to bring to the closing table for down payment and closing costs, um, your credit score and uh, your debts, right? So income, assets, debts, credit. But those four things, we can come up with what you would be eligible to borrow and within that, which loan programs you'd be eligible to use to borrow that money. All right. So again, I don't want to get too nitty gritty in this episode. We're going to dive into kind of loan programs and pre-approvals and pre-quals later on. Today, just know that that is generally step one is to get a pre-approval with a loan officer, unless you're paying cash. Okay. So we do the pre-approval. I tell you, okay, it looks like you could go up to maybe $300,000 as a purchase price. If you're putting 5% down, let's say, uh, be prepared to bring this amount to closing and your monthly payment could be this, right? So now you have a parameter to go out and, and search for that house. That's when you go back to the realtor and you can tell them, hey, I just got pre-approved with Justin. He said, I'm good up to 300,000. That's within my budget for both cash to close and monthly payment. Let's go look at some houses. So from there, it's kind of a combo of you might find some stuff online or they'll they'll set you up on an auto drip kind of campaign where if something comes up that's in your parameters, it's going to be emailed to you immediately. Also, a huge benefit of working with good agents is they have access to what are called pocket listings where they know about a property that's not listed yet, but they're interested sellers, right? So like amongst the realtor community, they'll kind of sometimes say, hey, you know, I'm about to list this. But if there are interested buyers who are ready to go, we're open to a conversation and you might be able to get a house before it's even listed. So you eliminate your competition. So that's a really, really big benefit of working with a realtor. So <clears throat> step one, you talk to me, you get pre-approved or talk to a loan officer, you get pre-approved. Now, you know, your budget and your search parameters, you go to the realtor and you start doing your home search. This is like the super fun phase <laughs> of buying a house. This is where you're, you're essentially window shopping on the other side of the window, right? Like now you're in the store and you're picking up the toys and saying, oh, cool. These are, these are exactly what I wanted. These aren't what I wanted. So now you're like literally going into people's homes thinking, hmm, could I live here? Right. And probably some good questions to ask uh, John and George on that episode is good things to look out for when looking at a house. So you'll, you'll come to find some places will be furnished and some won't be. Some will be a complete pigsty and some will be perfectly clean. And it can get really tricky trying to envision yourself in a house when there's clothes on the floor and you live a lifestyle where everything's folded and put away before you leave for the day. Or if you go into a vacant house that doesn't have any furniture in it and it's just left to your imagination on where the furniture should go versus a completely staged home that kind of gives you a, a template on, hey, this is how this room typically is arranged. Right. You can picture yourself in the house when it's arranged. It's a little harder to think of it when it's a blank canvas. It just depends on who you are. But that's again, that's where it gets really fun. Right. Sometimes it's it's really nice going into a completely empty home and thinking like, oh, wow, we could put the couch there and the TV there. And then maybe we have a bar over here. And hey, maybe we could put an island in the kitchen and just gets the, the wheels turning. And you really start to get that energy and excitement of like, wow, I'm about to call something my own. This is really fun. So it's kind of like the honeymoon phase of the home buying process. Uh, you're searching and then things start to get more serious and you finally find a house that's like, okay, I think this is the one I want to put an offer in. Best advice I can give once you get to this stage 
is temper your expectations, especially in today's market. It is still a strong seller's market, meaning it's competitive as a buyer, right? So there's two markets. There's a buyer's market and there's a seller's market. Technically, there are three. There is the balanced market, but more or less, it's doing this over time, right? Like right now, it's a seller's market, meaning it's tough for buyers. We're starting to see it shift. Eventually, it'll be a little more even, and that's when it's pretty nice. And then eventually, it'll go the other direction where if you're a buyer, you're happy. But if you're a seller, it's tough. And really, what dictates what market we're in is supply and demand. So right now, there's a ton of demand. There's a lot of buyers out there looking for houses, but there's just not enough inventory or homes for sale supply, right? So when that happens, the seller has all the power because they have you know, maybe 10 buyers for every house that's being sold. So they have 10 options of offers to look at. So now you're just competing with nine other buyers to get that house, therefore driving the price up, right? Uh, it's a bit of a tangent there, but that could be another good episode is just talking about how home values are are established. Uh, then, you know, the opposite is when, okay, now there's way more sellers and not enough buyers. Now we're in a buyer's market. That's when you might see some price decreases, maybe potentially depreciation, right? That's when depreciation enters the picture. That's something we haven't seen in a while. We've just been seeing rampant appreciation. And honestly, that's something that's still predicted to continue into the next probably five years or so, at least the next one year. CoreLogic, which is a company that's kind of the gold standard of home appreciation, just came out with a report saying the next 12 months, home values are projected to go up another 3%. I digress, getting a little nerdy there. So back to the topic at hand, temper your expectations a little bit. It's incredibly exciting to submit an offer on a house. It's scary. Your part's pumping as soon as you hit that sign button on the dot loop. Right. So dot loop is the electronic signature for uh, submitting the offer. Maybe you're old school and you're signing it on paper. Either way, your heart's racing. You're like, oh my God, it's happening. There's no turning back now. If they accept, we're buying this house. <laughs> and uh, it's super pumped. I know when my wife and I were putting an offer in, we, we went through multiple, but the first one, we talked about it for so long, like hours. So we're just going back and forth like, oh man, is this really it? I really like this, but I'm not so sure about that. Well, it fits our budget. It's a bit of a push, but man, we could make it work. Okay, let's do it. And, and we did it and we're just kind of waiting, 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 waiting. And then turns out we didn't get it. So we went through a couple of those before we found ours. Um, but again, you know, that's why we temper expectations, right? Don't completely fall in love with a place until you have that accepted offer. And even then, you know, you want to kind of still temper because some things could still go wrong. And we'll talk about that. So you find the house, you want to put in an offer. That's when you talk to your realtor. They'll give you a really good idea of what you should offer. Most of the time, they're going to put it on you though, right? It's it's your offer. It's your decision on what you should offer, but they will absolutely offer their advice if you ask them directly. So say a house is listed for 300. It's been on the market for two weeks. Today's market, that's surprisingly kind of a long time when most houses are going under contract within one week. So if it's been on the market for two, maybe you have two different schools of thought there. One, what's wrong with the place? Uh, two, hey, here's an opportunity to lowball, right? Now, lowballing, it just depends if that's a good idea or not. And again, that's where ask your realtor, see what they think. They can talk to the listing agent and gauge like, all right, are there other offers on the table? What's the deal? And they'll be able to guide you like, yeah, we should probably at least do asking or list price, right? With our offer or, hey, yeah, let's try 290 on the $300,000 list price. Or maybe they'll know there are five other offers already on the table. How badly do you want this? If you want it real bad, maybe we bump it up to 310, right? So it all depends. And that's a conversation you'll have with your realtor. When you're putting the offer together, the realtor has a kind of like a pre-can template of what offers are, and they're just kind of filling in the blanks with you, working out the, the legal verbiage to make sure that everything is in place. A uh, couple things to keep in mind when you're writing an offer, it has to be accompanied by a pre-approval letter if you're getting financing. So that's something I provide or the loan officer provides. Now, a lot of people think, and I guess we'll back up a second. If you talk to a realtor and they say, hey, do you have a pre-approval letter or are you pre-approved? A lot of people think that you need to like physically have a letter and like are walking around with it saying, I'm pre-approved, I'm pre-approved, come show me houses. It, it's not that literal. They just want to know that you've talked to somebody like me and if they need a letter, they can get it quickly, right? So people that I talk to who talk to a realtor first, they come to me all the time and they're just like, hey, I need a letter. 
and then I'll say, okay, well, let's do the pre-approval and then I'll call your realtor and just tell them, Hey, they're good to go. Maybe up to 300,000 or so. If you find a specific property they're interested in, send it to me. I'll make sure that they're still eligible for it. And I'll send a letter to match your offer. So that's what you need to keep in mind is you don't need to like walk around with a pre-approval letter. You can actually just search based on the parameters we discuss in your pre-approval. And then when you go to submit an offer on a property, tell me what your what amount you're offering. So say you're doing the low ball approach on this one and you're offering 290 on the $300,000 list. Then I will send a pre-approval letter that shows a purchase price of 290,000. Now, two schools of thought there. One of them that's more common is I, you know, I don't want to give you a pre-approval letter showing whatever your maxed out pre-approval is, which could be like maybe 500,000. Right? What that means is, hey, we've looked at your income, debts, assets, and credit, and we're willing to lend you up to $500,000 of a purchase price with 5% down. You maybe don't want a pre-approval letter that says that if you're putting in offers for 290, because now you're just showing your hand to the seller. And if there's another offer on the table, they know with 100% certainty that you technically could go higher with your offer. So that's one school of thought. So typically what I'll do is I'll just send a letter to match exactly what your offer is. And then they don't know like for sure, if you can go higher, they probably have a pretty good idea. Most people that are putting in offers technically can go higher, but they don't know how much higher. The other school of thought is that's crazy. People don't really think like that. Just give me the letter at 500 and we'll use it on every offer. And that's, you know, up to you and your realtor on comfort level and kind of what your realtor thinks the situation is with that house. But I will say probably 90 to 95% of the time, I'm sending a letter to match your specific offer. Okay, so now you know you want to offer 290 on the house. <clears throat> the realtor drafted up the offer. You signed it. I sent the pre-approval letter. The second thing you need to be prepared for is something called uh, a contract deposit or an earnest money deposit, EMD. And basically this typically is one to 2% of your offer amount. So in this case, typically you're rounding. So 1% of 290 is 2,900. You probably just do three grand to six grand, right? Somewhere in there. What this is, is just money you're putting up front to show you're serious about buying the house, right? And later on, when you're at the closing table, let's say your EMD, your earnest money was three grand. And we know that you need to bring 15,000 to closing to cover your down payment and closing costs. Now, you know, because you already gave three, all you have to have remaining to bring is 12. That's all it is. So the, the EMD contract deposit often gets confused with the down payment. People all the time are thinking that those are the same thing. And it, it I can understand it because it's often referred to as deposit. And then we're talking about down payment two terms that begin with D, they both are very similar. So they're easily confused, but just know that the deposit is more like a, a partial prepayment on your down payment and closing costs. It's, it's its own thing. And it's really just to make your offer a little bit stronger to show like, Hey, I'm putting some skin in the game. That's how interested I am in buying this house. Uh, sometimes I'll see people make that contract deposit like super high again, to put themselves ahead of the competition. So earlier in 2022, when that was probably the most competitive I've seen it. So I've been doing this about six years now and 2020 through 2022 were wild and talking to other people in the industry who've been doing this for 20 to 30 years, like my mom, you know, this is the third worst, worst market that we've seen, meaning like it's, it's just wild, right? There's so many buyers and not enough sellers. So that's when things get super competitive. So early 2022, I did see a couple of scenarios where people were putting, you know, make 50 to a hundred thousand dollars as a contract deposit on these homes where their cash to close is pretty close to that 50 or a hundred thousand. So they're almost bringing everything to the table right up front. So you're going to need to write that. Now, the way those work is, they are going to go to the seller if you terminate the contract before the closing date. And the only way you can retain it is if you utilize a contingency to get that back. So all contracts have kind of pre-canned contingencies. Um, again, with it being a seller's market, you see a lot of those get waived. So the more common ones are like a, an inspection contingency, meaning I want to get a property inspection 
and make sure this place isn't going to fall apart day one after I buy it before I continue any further. Uh, another one is the appraisal. Like it needs to appraise for the amount we're buying it for. Like you don't want to buy something for 290 and find out it's only worth 200. That'd be awful. Um, trying to think of other common, those are the big ones really. Um, <clears throat> it's good. So there, there are a couple other ones, but those are the two that I see the most as, you know, on the lending side where most of the time when someone's terminating, it's because of the inspection, right? And pretty rarely is it because of the appraisal. Usually we're kind of getting ahead of that with your realtor. Um, but what this means is, so you give your deposit and if you're going to, if you want to get it back by utilizing a contingency, let's say it's the inspection, there's a date associated with that contingency. So the inspection contingency could say you have 10 days after execution of this contract or 10 days after you sign to have an inspection and make your decision on if you want to continue to move forward. If within that 10 days you have the inspection and you find out the foundation needs to be replaced next year and you're like, okay, I don't want to deal with that. Let's back out of the contract. You can get that contract deposit back because you backed out due to the inspection and it was within the 10 days. If you wait until the 11th day, sure, you, you backed out because of the inspection, but you didn't meet the timeline. So technically the seller can just keep your, your contract deposit in that case, right? So they are pretty serious. Uh, <clears throat> it's another reason why some people were putting massive deposits down to make themselves more competitive because as a seller, wouldn't you want the $50,000 deposit versus the $3,000 deposit? Even if the 50,000 had an offer that was 10 grand less, like, well, hey, if they back out, we get 50 grand. So there's some tactics to go into that. That's again, probably a, a story for another day. Um, but that's something to definitely keep in mind is plan on maybe one to 2% of your purchase price or offer amount to, to be given upfront as a deposit on your offer. So that was a long tangent on on offers. Now you've submitted the offer and you wait to hear. The seller will review all offers at a certain point in time and determine which one they're going to go with. If they don't choose yours, back to square one, you keep searching and put an offer on the next place and keep going and keep going until eventually somebody accepts your offer. Now you are under contract is what it's referred to as. So we're almost pop a champagne bottles because, hey, that's you know a big part of this battle is just getting an offer accepted. But now we got to get it to the finish line, right? So what that really entails is, a, at least from my perspective, it's a lot on the financing side if you're getting financing. There's, there's other things going on with the attorneys and the insurance and the realtors. They're all doing their part. <clears throat> but for the financing, that's when it really kicks into high gear. So what I mean by that is between the time when your offer is accepted and when it's scheduled to close, we are verifying everything that you've ever told us about yourself to make sure that it's true. <laughs> um, so general timeline, typically 30 to 45 days after you sign is when we can close. So pretty much every realtor is aware of that and they'll put in a closing date on the contract that kind of fits. So today's January 3rd. I'd say anything you know, around February 10th as a closing date, if it was accepted today, it would be fine, right? Um, <clears throat> the reason it's that length of time, A, is because we have to verify all those things, but B, the big one is we need an appraisal on the property. So an appraisal is going to tell us the value of the home and it's going to give us details on the state of the home in terms of health and safety. So if the appraiser goes out there and they take some pictures of, Peeling paint, let's say, when it's a government loan, FHA. Don't worry about the terminology of those yet. We're going to get into that in another episode. But government loans aren't very keen on peeling paint with homes that potentially have lead paint. So if that comes up in appraisal, now our underwriters know about it. Now we're going to require that it gets fixed before we close. Okay, so that's something, again, to keep in mind uh, as you're looking at homes. Realtors are pretty aware of that, at least in this area. So they might know up front and we can get ahead of it a little bit. Uh, but that appraisal typically takes three to four weeks to get back once we order it. A lot of it depends on where you're buying the home. So here in Vermont, if you're buying in Chittenden County, that's where a lot of the appraisers are. We're getting those back in about two weeks right now. Uh, middle of last year and the beginning of last year, it was taking a month and a half to get them back. It was crazy. It was a lot busier. Now we're a little bit more back to normal. 
Uh, so maybe two weeks for Chinon County. If it's outside of Chinon County, like Southern Vermont, that could take up to a month or more still. So that heavily will dictate when we can actually close, right? Because we need to wait for the appraisal to come in. Then our team needs to review it. Then we need to make sure we have everything else. Then we need an writing to sign off one more time and then we can close. So it's a bit of a process, but that's kind of the big thing that is going to set the tone for the length of time between when you sign and when you can close. So you sign, you get a, you both, you both sign the contract, you both get copies. Now we're off to the races. For me, step one is, okay, let's set up a call or a meeting where I've already looked at the contract. I've got your loan application officially submitted at this point, right? So in the pre-approval, we're filling out the application with everything except for a property address. Now we have the contract, plug in the address and boom, your, your application is submitted now officially. So we're going to go over a few things uh, with me. The big ones I hit are who are you going to use for an attorney? So if you're buying in Vermont, we are an attorney state, meaning we use attorneys versus title companies, which a lot of other states, most of them will use title companies rather than attorneys. Now, what these entities do is they perform a title search on the property where they go to the town clerk's office in Vermont. They physically go to a lot of them because we don't have all our records electronic yet. We're getting there, but not there yet. So they'll go through 40 years of land records just to make sure that there are no outstanding liens or anything on the property. So say, you know, Joe back in 1920 uh, borrowed five grand from their neighbor to, to put in a fence and they never paid them back, but that no one remembered it. And it's just been sold and sold. Well, now you're buying it and your attorney found that lien. If they didn't find it, then you would technically be liable to pay it back had you closed and it wasn't taken care of, right? So it's crucial that they're doing this. Um, so they're doing a title search and we want to see clean title at the end of it. Uh, what they also do is facilitate closing. So when you go to close, you're going to go to their office. Typically it's the buyer's agent's office. Sorry, the buyer's attorney's office. Everyone goes there, sign the paperwork, you get the keys and you have a house. Um, so attorneys in Vermont, I'll want to know who your attorney is. And then I want to know who you're going to use for homeowners insurance. That one's a little less time sensitive, right? We want to order the title work quickly because that can take a while for them to get it. The insurance, they're pretty fast to begin with. So we want to know up front, but maybe you give it, you can, you can take a couple of weeks to shop around if you want to. Uh, but basically you want to make sure you have a homeowner's insurance policy set up because that's required by the mortgage to have homeowner's insurance. Um, what people often don't realize is that you can bundle homeowners with auto and other personal property insurance, right? Uh, property casualty insurance is kind of the, the overarching term. So anything that is your own personal property, including your home and your vehicles, you could bundle all of that into one policy and we'll just take the portion that's for the home and count that in your mortgage payment. So we want to know who your attorney is, who you're going to use for insurance. Uh, we're going to want to know a contact at your work, typically someone in HR or payroll that we can reach out to, to verify employment and income. So we want to know, does this person actually work here? Is this their title? Is this how much they make? Is this how much they have made historically, depending on how long you've been there? So that's part of the verification. Um, then beyond that, we're gathering documentation. So we want, generally, these are the ones that we always want. It's going to be different person to person based on how you're paid and what you do for work. But in general, photo ID, most recent 30 days of pay stubs, most recent two months of bank statements for any accounts that you're going to use for closing, right? So if you have a checking account with 40 grand in it and a savings with two grand, and you're only going to use the money from the checking to pay for closing costs and down payment, we only need that statement. If you've made transfers between the two in the last two months, then we'll probably need both if they're large transfers. Uh, W-2s for the last two years. And most of the time, we want to see your tax returns for the last two years, but not always. If you're a commission-based employee, we'll absolutely want <clears throat> excuse me your tax returns. If you're a self-employed business owner, we'll want your 1099s. We'll want your business returns. If you own other properties, we'll want those mortgage statements, tax bills, homeowners insurance declarations pages, you know, if you're part of a trust, we want trust paperwork. It, it just kind of goes on and on depending on your situation. If you've been divorced, we want a divorce decree. Uh, if you filed bankruptcy within the last seven years, we want discharge paperwork. You know, it, it kind of just keeps building depending on your situation. But if you're a first time home buyer, you've never been divorced, never had a bankruptcy, never owned property before you don't own other properties and you're paid a salary, that's pretty cut and dry. 
those five first things I said, ID, pay stubs, bank statements, W-2s and tax returns are all we'll need. Uh, now, let me take a step back. Most of the time I'm getting this stuff up front. So this first phase is pretty quick. We're getting that and maybe we're buttoning up. Hey, let's get a more recent pay stub because it's been two weeks since you gave us one. And now we're, we have everything we need. So from here, we're under contract. We've submitted the application. What happens next is your file goes into underwriting. The underwriters are the ones that go through with a fine tooth comb, all of our guidelines, which are hundreds of pages to make sure that we're hitting every single rule of what determines your, your credit worthy, right? Um, for example, if they look, if they're looking at a bank statement and they see a deposit, that's maybe five grand, we're going to want to know where that deposit came from. If it wasn't a paycheck, right? This all stems from, you know, like the Patriot Act, basically like money laundering laws and anti-terrorism efforts. So I get that question a lot is, oh, why do you want to know where that came from? Well, we need, we need to know what you're using to buy this house and like, where is this money actually coming from? So that's actually a good point. If you are a person that doesn't believe in banks and you just keep cash under the mattress, zero judgments from me personally, people do what they want. But from our perspective as lenders, we have to know where that money came from. And if it's cash under the mattress, it's near impossible to source, right? It's been done before, but it, it takes a lot of paperwork and documentation to prove where it came from. I think the only time I've been able to count cash was when somebody withdrew cash from an ATM and kept the receipt and then walked over across the street to a different bank and deposited the cash within like an hour. And we just matched up the withdrawal and deposit receipts, showed the, the day, the time and the amounts. And it was all lining up to be pretty close. <laughs> then we were able to say, okay, that's legit. That's, we can source that cash and it's okay. But most of the time we can't source cash. So Whenever possible, when you're buying a house, if you have cash, just keep it where it is. Don't put it in the bank because it's just going to cause more problems down the line. So we want to see money that's been in, in the bank and uh, <clears throat> so we can source where it came from. Right? Uh, so we're, they read into underwriting. They're going through everything. Once they comes out of underwriting, once they've done their review, we get what's called a conditional approval. Okay, That conditional approval just says, yep, we're going to lend you the money, but we just need to meet this list of conditions. Most of that list is stuff we're taking care of, like get the appraisal, get the insurance binder, get the title work. But the other stuff sometimes is stuff you as a buyer has to do. Like we need another pay stub. We need another bank statement. Uh, why did this pay stub show 39 hours instead of 40? Stuff like that, you know, and that can be a problem depending on how long you've been with the employer. So keep that in mind. If you say you work 40 hours, make sure you're actually working 40 hours every week so that we can document it. So now we're going through meeting the conditions. Appraisal comes in, title work comes in, all that stuff comes in. We're checking off boxes. As soon as every box is checked on that list of conditions, we're in a position to submit for a clear to close. Clear to close is the term that people love in our industry because it means we've reached the finish line. Yes, we're here. There's nothing else that needs to be done. So we're submitting for a clear to close. We're 99.99% .99 sure that it's going to close. We just need underwriting to look at it one more time and sign off and tell us it is clear to close. So we submit another day or two goes by. They come back saying, yep, you're clear to close. Everyone's happy. A closing disclosure is sent out. That's a final uh, itemization of all costs for closing. So down payment and everything that makes up your closing costs. That could be another episode. Uh, you get that money to the attorney or the title company. Typically, they just want to see a wire transfer or a certified bank check. Personal checks take too long to transfer if they're more than $5,000. They, they put a stop on them for maybe four days, but we need that money transfer to be instant. So wire transfer is instant and certified bank check is instant. So we want to see those. You go to closing, be sure to bring your ID with you. Be sure to bring a personal check with you in case there are some the variance is at closing with the numbers and you need to bring another 200. Cool. You have a personal check. You can write that right there. You uh, go to closing, you sign all the paperwork you've already signed one more time, <laughs> and then you get the keys and now you're a homeowner. So that was the kind of high level detailed version of what it takes start to finish to buying a house. Listening back in my mind to everything I just said, it sounds like a lot. And honestly, it is a lot. There's a lot that goes into this. And that's why you work with people like me, like a realtor, 
like an attorney, like an insurance agent, because you just can't do it all on your own, right? Like I have to get licensed. The realtor has to get licensed. There's an attorney, the, the insurance agent, all have, we all have licenses to professionally do these things. So you got to work with us. And also it's, why would you ever want to do that on your own? It's too much. So we're all here to help you. That's the big thing to keep in mind. It is a lot, but we can make it easy. And the the main thing is it's it's exciting, right? We want to get you back to that honeymoon phase. So you're getting pre-approved. You're searching for houses. You're pumped. All right. Excitement is up here. And then we're going through the process and it's a little, a little rickety sometimes. So we're trying to make it as smooth as possible every step of the way. And then you get to the end and it just skyrockets again. That first time you walk through the door of a house that you own, you can't really explain that feeling, you know, like even though you've been to the house multiple times for showings and you do a final walkthrough before you close to make sure there's no extra holes in the wall or anything. It's just not the same. Like the final walkthrough that my wife and I did was either the day before or the morning of our closing still didn't feel like ours. It was empty and we knew we were about to buy it, but I was just like, okay, this is someone else's house. And then we closed and signed the paperwork, went to the house. I remember we, uh, we sit, we ordered, uh, gosh, what was it? I think three brothers pizza and Colchester and sat in our, one of our living rooms with a fireplace, lit the fireplace. And we just sat on the floor because we didn't have any furniture and just ate pizza and had some wine. And we're just like, holy cow, like we own this. And that feeling is just something else. So really excited for anybody looking to buy a house. Again, if you're a first timer or repeat buyer, I'm here for you. I have resources of people that I can connect you with if you need them. And I really hope you enjoyed this first episode. Uh, again, please subscribe, uh, Spotify, uh, YouTube for the video version. I don't even know. Apple, I think, has podcasts. I, I usually listen on Spotify, so I don't know where the other ones are. Listen wherever you listen. Uh, subscribe. Hit the bell. And uh, if you want to suggest ideas for more content, please reach out. My contact info is about to be shown for anyone listening. It's jmead at homebridge.com, jmead at homebridge.com. I'd be happy to, to put together an episode catered to what you're looking to looking for. And uh, that's all. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you have a great day.